Okay. Hello everyone, this is Maylin Antiborda and for today we will talk about the political dimensions of language teaching and their participatory approach. So this video Um, I mean, this video examines the, polit uh, the politics of language learning and usage. So we, we also talk about one approach to teaching languages, so, which is the participatory approach that focuses particularly on the political aspects of education. So we have here the, the politics of language. So... This is because of its status as an international language. It is English that is seen to the language of power. So language, uh, we all know that language acquisition is political act. So those who are literate in a language are empowered in a manner that illiterates are not. So English is now perceived as the language of power due to its standing as an international language. So and also, a lot of people say that by learning English, it will help us to get a good job or a good education. So because they think that learning English will help them achieve a decent school or job, many people around the world aspire to learn the language. So they believe that knowing English increases their chances of advancing economically. So aside from that, by learning English, it might result to fade or die of the native language. So some individuals are worried about what is lost when someone learns English or something adds on English speaking identity. So they fear that acquiring English might result to the loss of some proficiency in another language, possibly even one's original tongue, or that developing a new identity as an English speaker. It might result also in the fading or death of an existing identity also the resulting ex um, i mean resulting educational inequity worries them on the one hand gradual notes that the availability of english as a global language is accelerating globalization on the other the globalization is accelerating the use of english so this view sees english as a tool that benefits the individual who learns it so not everyone has the chance i mean not everyone has the chance to study english after all so more generally some fear that english dominance may result in the extension of endangered languages including those spoken by native speakers and immigrants in nations where english is the primary language particularly when english only policies are implemented so the question now is, whose English should be taught? Okay, we have here the Kakurus concentric circles of English. So, related to these issues is the political questions of whose English is to be the language of instruction. So, should... Um, should it be the native speaker English as is spoken in the United Kingdom or the United States or what Kaku calls other inner circle countries, which you can see at the illustration. So these types clearly differ from one another and from one another. So a decision must be taken. So what about the different dialects of english that are used in other nations where english is widely spoken and frequently in official language so countries such as india and nigeria and singapore which kaku refers to as the outer circle countries so the third i mean the third circle in the kaku's model as what you can i mean what you can see at the, uh, the illustration so we have 
here the third circle which is uh, what we call the expanding circle so this is contains millions of people who speak english as a second language so they generally employ it for inter-language communication so occasionally even within a single nation so in other words english is used primarily uh, primarily as contact language so this variety has been called as english as a lingua franca so or the english as an international language or global english so one may who i um, one may wonder who owns i mean why one may wonder who owns the language i mean the english language one may wonder who owns the english language so one answer is one answer to this question is that English belongs to those for whom it is the mother tongue. So, those who speak it from childhood. So, it means that everyone regularly uses English for whatever purpose is the owner of English. Another is English is needed for a sense of community that can be a threat to multilingualism. So, their response is to no longer consider English to be a language owned by native English speaker in order to maintain a cohesive community and preserve the freedoms of speakers of other languages. So, so the standards of, for English as a lingua franca are established by its users as it is the case with all languages so of course the best persons to address the question of which english should be taught where and when is obviously someone inside the local educational system next is the critical discourse analysis so what is critical discourse analysis so Critical discourse analysis, this is the study of how identity and power relations are constructed in language. This is also a uh, this is also observe and comment on how language is linked to social practice and the implicit message that is sometimes conveyed. For instance, Stubbs cites the example of a headline from an apartheid era south african newspaper upon the release of nelson's mandela from prison the headline read who blacks clashed with police it would i mean it would have been possible for the headline to to have uh, had a different word order like police clashed with Hubilant blacks, but this would have assigned responsibility for initiating the confrontation to the police, not to the blacks. So, texts are not ideologically neutral. So, in other words, so beyond this, there is a lack of neutrality in other facets of identity. For instance, language education materials that put portray women as a constantly being um, subservient to men constitute gender discrimination. So these problems can, of course, occur with languages other than English as well. So we would discover that whether the language was Dutch, English, French, German, Portuguese, Russian, Spanish, or another there would be concerns and problems regarding language use and power dynamics in the majority of nations that have previously been ruled by another great power so nobody is advocating for teachers to forego teaching the language that their students which i mean students wish to master so what can educators do about language politics so the bare minimum response to this question is that it's critical for educators to become knowledgeable about political concerns related to language use. Language is not just taught by language teachers, right? So language is not just taught by language teachers as a neutral means of meaning expression. So that's why we have this critical 
I mean, that's why we have these critical approaches to pedagogy. So, critical approaches to pedagogy, this is an approach to teaching that aims to create a more egalitarian society by raising awareness of social injustice as a necessary part of their curriculum. So, someone else shouldn't decide what you should do about critical pedagogy because um, they could not be familiar with your teaching situation or your political views. So, here are some concepts that have been considered if you want to become more critical in your teaching. We have here first, um, okay, we have here the literacy. So, okay, we have here the literacy. So, some educators have examined literacy as a plural rather than a singular concept. So, highlighting the fact that access to the specific English language norms, um, grammar, and vocabulary used by those in authority is necessary for learners to participate in a literate English culture. So, another is by literacy, students would thus a student would thus be learning more than simply how to read in English. So they would also be learning how to talk about politics, education, and also business. So it is empowering to get familiar with the distinct, uh, distinctive forms, language, and norms of various discourses. Okay, we have here next the multi um, plurilingualism and multi-competence so teachers can encourage a favorable attitude toward all languages in order to prevent one language from dominating completely so learning a language should never be done in a subtractive way in other words the language being studied should not be used in, uh, in a place of any other language but others should improve the learner's ability to communicate in language so many english language learners are plurilingual so, which is the capacity to speak more than one language to the extent necessary without compromise, uh, compromising in a language they have learned. So, this is by uh, Council of Europe to comment on 2007. So, and as a teacher, it is your responsibility to respect your students' identities as plurilinguals. So, also, Cook on 2000. Um, Cook on 2002 contends that teaching languages should focus on developing multi-competence and successful language used rather than writing, I mean, trying to encourage students to imitate monolingual native speakers. So the next is the non-native speakers as teachers. So the subject of teachers' speakers' status is another political one, whether native speaker or non-native speaker. So as they serve as a model and have access to intuition, I mean, intuit, uh, intuitive knowledge about what is right and how um, how the language functions. So many language instructions programs favor hiring native speakers. So, however, in actual fact. Non-native speakers have a lot to offer when it comes to teaching languages, not the least of which is the fact that they are leaving examples of how to, um, how to learn effectively. In addition, if they are bilingual like their students are, they are aware of and skilled at overcoming language learning challenges. Hence, rather than being a matter of competence, the uh, standing, I mean, this the standing of the teacher is one of politics. So, excuse me. A good teacher can be found regardless of um, whether or not they are native speakers of the language they are teaching. So, the next is hidden curriculum. So, a teacher's awareness of a language um, class hidden curriculums is what is being taught and learned, but is 
but is not explicitly stated. So is a rel- this is a related topic. So what do teachers mean, for instance, when they arrange the deaths of their pupils in a circle rather than leaving them arranged in rows? So what message, uh, what message is conveyed when a teacher asks these students what they want to accomplish in class? So what differentiates this message from a teacher introducing a thoroughly taught, uh, a thoroughly taught out curriculum on the first day of class? So what if a teacher decides not to carry out certain exercises from the course book and substitutes exercises based on the background and interests of the students? So what significance could the students and perhaps other concerned parties like parents and ad- administrators. So what significance could the students place on these behaviors? And it is that, uh, it is that significance good or negative? So you might have to change the way you think about what and how you teach in order to respond to this, um, to these questions. So as we have seen, there is, a na- uh, there is now a conversation and frequently a debate about the politics of teaching and studying English in English programs and English teacher education programs all around the world. So, so here is... Um, a question and some advice to think about as we wrap up this introduction. So the question is, do you see English as something helpful in allowing people from around the world to communicate with each other or as something that is potentially a problem or the problem of uh, English taking over the world? So this is by Philipson, 2008 question. So First is you might wish to ask your students what they believe about this question. Second, you could also want to think about adding English and English literacies are not part of the curriculum or textbook you have been hand, um, had, uh, handed to your classroom. And lastly, consider how much you could talk about your students' life, problems, and difficulties with learning English in your language classes so the last that we will discuss is the participatory approach one response to the politics of language teaching although paulo freely or freely who is arguably the most well-known of all critical educators, developed the participatory method in the late 1950s. It wasn't um, until the 1980s that the participatory approach became widely addressed in the literature on language education. So, what is participatory approach? So, in some ways, the participatory approach is similar to content-based instruction in that it begins with content that content that is meaningful to the students. So, it leads to the language that is being worked on. So, the sub uh, the substance of the content though is this uh, noticeable difference. So, it is not the material of textbooks on the subject. Rather, it is content deri- derived from problems that are important to students. Another is the participatory approach is based on growing awareness of the role that education in general and language education spe- um, specifically have on creating and um, per- um, perpetuating tweeting power di- dynamics in society. So as Anne Berthoff has written, Education does not um, substitute for political action, but it is indispensable to um, to it because of the role of it plays in the I mean it plays in the development of critical consciousness that in turn is dependent on the transforming power of language. Another is a participatory approach 
aims to enable students to act and make choices in order to take control of their lives in that context by first assisting them in understanding the social, historical, or cultural influences that produce that setting. So posting, always remember that posting problems is a key component of the participatory approach. So problem presenting entails choosing actual um, actual problems from the students' day, uh, daily lives and involves them in an unrestricted problem solving. And okay... Um, okay... I just want to say that posing problems is a key component of the participatory approach. So problem presenting entails choosing actual problems from the students' daily lives and involves them in an unrestricted problem solving. So that would be all and that end with my discussion. And again, this is Mylene Antiporda. Thank you for listening and God bless.